Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Ovington. I'm the head of UX at Travelport, and I'm based in Dublin, Ireland. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, how Travelport is transforming itself to become a design organization um, so we can make the experience of buying and consuming travel better for everyone. Uh, we've all heard about the experience economy. We all uh, know user experience is good for business. Uh, as Forbes say, companies that invest in UX see lower cost of acquisition, lower support costs, increased customer retention, and increased market share. And the opposite is also true. Companies that fail to invest in user experience have higher cost of acquisition, higher support costs, high, increased cost to customer retention, and lower market share. Uh, and this has been monitored for about a, a decade now by a company called Forrester, who keep what they call a CX index, or customer experience index. Um, and they've been researching this and publishing this research over the years, and their data shows clearly in the, last, in the first five years of this decade, UX leaders grew their revenues, grew their compound annual uh, CAGR by 17%, uh, whereas these UX laggards uh, only grew by 3%. So leaders in the space, and this, this, this basket of companies, this CX index, includes hotels, airlines, car rental firms. So it includes a basket of companies across many different industries. So CX leaders, UX leaders grow their, their revenues up to five times faster than their competition. In the same period, they also grew the market capitalization uh, 43% in that, in that period. The S&P 500, an uh, index of shares in the US, only grew 14%. This, is a, this period, 2010 to 2015, is worth remembering, coincided with the global economic crisis. So this is a really tough time uh, for all companies. And the UX laggards lost a third of their value in the same time. So you know, experience really is a long-term view of value. It helps companies succeed and grow in good times and in bad. Um, and how does it do that? Well, there's, there's three main ways that Forrester have identified, and these are actually really quite intuitive. Uh, those three ways that companies make experience pay is through retention, enrichment, and advocacy. And when I say these are intuitive, you'll go, yeah, in a few minutes when I explain. Retention really is about the tendency for happy customers to stay lo loyal. They're much less likely to switch to, a competition, to, to competitors. Enrichment is the fact that they spend more. Not only do they come back and spend again, but they actually, the total, let's say, shopping basket uh, transaction is higher on average for loyal customers. They purchase more and they purchase again from the company. And the last way in which you know, experience pays is through advocacy. Happy customers tell other people about their experience. Uh, they broadcast, as we saw um, with the example of EasyJet. They're much more likely to recommend the company to another company. Now this all seems pretty intuitive, and you would think that you know, a really leading research company like uh, Forrester would be uh, you know, a little bit embarrassed to come with this revelation, because it is, it, is, it is true. After all, we're all trying to win in the experience economy, but those UX dividends don't come easily. Uh, to deliver a great user experience is to climb a competitive mountain. Uh, there is complexity, there is competition, there is changing technology. And there is the customer expectations, which are constantly changing. It wasn't that long ago where if you were at 30,000 feet and you could send an email on the airline Wi-Fi, you would weep with joy, you know? And now you can't stream Netflix, it's like the end of the world. So our ex customers' expectations are constantly changing. But businesses at the top of the mountain, these uh, leaders, these, these experienced leaders, uh, provide experiences that are exceptional and remarkable. The word I use, I use the word remarkable deliberately because that's literally what they do. They remark upon the product. They share it. They talk about it, as we saw with EasyJet. Um, but to get to exceptional and remarkable, you have to build it up along the way. Uh, to get to exceptional and remarkable, you have to be, first of all, personal and convenient. You have to anticipate your users' needs. You have to um, meet their expectations around what's right for me at this time, and travel, as we know, context is constantly changing because your location is constantly changing, time is constantly changing. Beyond personally convenient, your product or your experience has to be basically usable and intuitive. Um, I worked in, my first job was as a usability engineer, and that, that title no longer exists. It was kind of absorbed into the design industrial complex, but I know how hard it is to get products to the market that are deeply usable and intuitive. Unusable products don't get used, it's a truism, uh, but usable products do. 
Beyond usable and intuitive, your product has to be at least be reliable and performant. It has to not crash. It has to be fast. If people have a minimum expectation, our expectations are constantly changing what fast actually is. 10 years ago, you would happily have waited about 12 seconds on average for a website to load. Now it's down to a second. If it's not loading instantly, you're gone. You know? So those expectations are changing too. And last of all, it has to be fundamentally functional. It has to actually solve some problem for you. you know, if it's just marketing fluff, you know, I know this respect to marketing, but if it's just something that doesn't solve a problem for me, it doesn't help me manage my booking, like in the example of EasyJet, if it's just there to you know, show me a schedule, it doesn't really help me solve a problem, which is you know, how do I get back home when my flight's canceled? So you need to deliver a great experience you need to be all these things. It isn't a case of you can just rock up and deliver a great experience. So to say you're customer-centric and to want to compete in the experience economies, to want to climb that mountain, it's to say you know, we're customer-centric and we want to deliver great experiences, but wanting to climb the mountain doesn't make you a mountaineer. You have to actually work on how you'll climb it. Uh, to climb this mountain, you have to be effective at experience design and otherwise, how can you meet your customers' expectations? So companies have to become effective, and this means organizations have to work on their design capabilities, on their what we call design maturity, to enable them to climb this mountain. Uh, and this is borne out in industry data too. So this is a study, these are results from a study carried out by Envision, who are a big design tooling firm. Uh, they make a, some, of the, some of the leading software in the industry. Uh, this is free to download for anyone. It's, called, it's a uh, survey done last year called the New Design Frontier. And this was a large-scale survey of 2,200 companies uh, investigating organizational design maturity and how effective organizations are at climbing this mountain. And they found very low maturity in the majority of organizations, only 5% of organizations at the top, delivering those remarkable, exceptional experiences. So organizations that expect to compete in the experience economy have to equip themselves to climb, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show what Travelport have been doing in terms of developing our design maturity, um, developing our capability to climb this mountain, uh, so to help our customers get to the top, so we can all reap the rewards of the experience economy. And how we climb that mountain is down to three main themes which I'm going to talk about. The first one is advocating design strategy. The second one is embedding design process. And the third one is empowering customer-focused teams. And these may be relevant to any organization here who has employees, designers, or is trying to build an in-house design function. There are other ways to get to the top of the mountain. You can hire an agency to do all the climbing for you. you know? That's another way. But we're building an in-house design function travel port, so we're be to become a design org. So firstly, advocating design strategy is about introducing techniques from design to apply design thinking and methods. Uh, like uh, journey mapping and personas to help the business better understand our customers and their needs. You know? Secondly, we're bringing in framework, introducing frameworks and processes that enable the organization to integrate design. And lastly, we're empowering customer-focused teams to get the people who are building our products as close to our customers as possible and our users. I use the, the words are used interchangeably, but users, the people who are using our software and our products, travel agents, developers, uh, airline ancillary managers, if you're out there, I don't know if there are any out there today, but those people who use our products, so they can, so they can actually uh, give us feedback on how well we're doing. Because the te getting teams closer to, closer to the customer and their problems enables those teams to solve those problems better. So you might have, so this is quite a popular, in, in the last 10 years, use of this uh, diagram has exploded. It's everywhere now. It's from a company, it was developed by a company called IDEO. A big Silicon Valley, very famous Silicon Valley design uh, consultancy that worked with Apple. And this is the kind of the design thinking Venn diagram. And it kind of dictates that to create value for your customer and for your business, you have to align three things. And it's not an option just to align two of them. They all have to be aligned. And those three things are business viability, technological feasibility, and customer desirability. Uh, business viability is how does this generate value for our business? You know, does it Reduce, reduce costs? Does it increase revenue? Does it increase market share and share price? Well, how does this actually generate value for our business? That's the first thing that has to be a part of any design solution. If it isn't, it won't make money. The second thing that needs to be aligned is technological feasibility. Now, before the advent of the smartphone, it wasn't feasible to enable people to do mobile check-in. So to deliver some new capability, to deliver an experience, there may be some technical feasibility that needs to be to be answered. 
uh, are addressed. And the third thing is customer desirability. And that's about, will the actual end user want to use this? Will this solve a problem for them? Will it deliver some kind of value for the person using it, whether it's a traveler or a travel agent or a developer? Uh, if no one's gonna use it, and this is the one, this is the, the, uh, the last sort of piece of the puzzle that IDEA brought in was that businesses before the advent of design thinking were very good at the first two. They were good at technology and good at business, but they weren't so good at talking, involving users in the design of their products to get their feedback and to validate those ideas quickly. Uh, so they, they made sure they, they hit their mark when they launched, when they came to market. So customer desirability is the third piece of the puzzle, and that involves just getting feedback constantly from uh, end users. And Traditionally, in, in a big company uh, like, like Travelport, there are people within the business who represent these different perspectives. So for business viability, you may have commercial people, you may have sales people who understand the industry really well. Uh, we have technologists like architects and developers who understand the travel technology really well. And we have people who try and understand the end user very well. We have account managers, sales people, marketing. We have our own research team as well in the, in the UX function who are speaking constantly to our users about what their needs and their problems are. So there's many different perspectives here and nobody has all the answers. Everyone thinks, they have, everyone thinks they're in the middle. And they know everything, but the fact is they don't. Our business is, is super complex. You know, nobody understands all these things equally well. There's always gonna be an expert on technology, an expert about the customer or an expert on what works for the business and where the business is going. So the process of design thinking is the process of aligning these things to create value and also executing once you've aligned those things. So it's not, not, just, a, it's not just a case of identifying an opportunity, it's the, it's the, the challenge of executing that, that opportunity really well too that we have to solve for. So it's the, this is the foundation of design strategy, introducing this idea to Travelport that you need to talk to users, you need to introduce their feedback into your product development process is, is key. And sounds obvious, but you know, a lot of companies still don't do it. So one of the first things we do from, from a design strategy perspective is to help people in our business understand our users or our customers better. And these are four personas we've developed in Travelport representing you, and there are, there are sets. There's many different types of agent or traveler, whether you're a leisure traveler or a weekender or a business traveler, whatever it is. There are developers, and there are a very large set of ops and admin people. Uh, and user, user, user perspective is often underrepresented, especially in large orgs, where, where people could work for years without ever having spoken to or seen an agent work, a travel agent work, in one example. So you could be a developer working in Travelport on SmartPoint and never have seen a travel agent or spoken to a travel agent. That's quite shocking when you say it, but that's not uncommon. Um, so develop, we, used, we used these personas to help build empathy with teams so they can understand the, the wants and the needs, the pain points, what a good day, what a bad day looks like for different types of, uh, of people. Um, we use them for onboarding. We introduce them to people when they start the company. We say, look, these are our personas. This is, this is who we deal with. This is who we're, who we're working for. Uh, so they, they get some feeling coming into the company that this is, this is the, these are the people we're building our products for. The second thing we do are to use customer journey maps. And this is another kind of strategic artifact. You may have seen these. They're really, they've, again, in the last five years, they've been, become really popular. And they're a way of kind of getting a 10,000 foot view of how is your customer interacting with your business. You know? So, you know, it's a snapshot. This is a snapshot of one persona's journey, customer journey. This, in this case, it's a leisure traveler uh, going from inspiration and planning a trip to returning home. And it maps out through, re through talking and observing to, through multiple studies, we understand better what are leisure travelers thinking and feeling and doing at different stages of the journey? What are their pain points? What are, there, are there opportunities that we can exceed their expectations? Are there really negative uh, experiences they're having that we can try and fix? You know? So they're an easy way to understand our customer interaction and where there are opportunities to fix that uh, or to uh, exceed it and, and build something that exceeds their expectations. It also uh, includes touch points. So that's like how the customer is interacting with, where, what channels the customer is using to interact. And that's, as Mike Croucher said, that is becoming increasingly fragmented. Five years ago, we could have been reasonably sure in saying if they're traveling, they're probably interacting via an app. But now, we, that we're not so sure. Well, we are pretty sure. We are pretty sure that it's highly fragmented. They're interacting with your 
um, your company through various different third-party platforms like messaging, uh, Twitter, social media, uh, websites, everything, email. There, uh, suffice to say, touch points are getting more and more fragmented. I think the, um, the speaker from Amdocs was showing how many um, uh, Pizza Hut, was it Pizza Hut? Or Domino's had, sorry. Uh, showing how many different potential touch points that you could have just to order a pizza, you know? So these, these are used in workshops to map out what the as-is state of a customer journey, like how are things currently, where are, where are the issues, and also what do we want a future journey to look like? What, do, what could a future look like so we can work towards that? It's a really high-level strategic document. The second thing you know, we do is we embed design process. Personas and journey maps are ways to communicate intent to the wider, to the wider business, you know, who our customers are, what, what their problems are, what an ideal state might look like. But integrating design is about embedding design process uh, into the business. Um, and we do that through a number of different ways. First of all, it's through facilitating collaboration. The design thinking approach, that Venn diagram, requires a high level of collaboration between those different people. So designers have this role of facilitating a high degree of collaboration with people representing those different perspectives. So we lead workshops. You know, we focus teams rep represented by product management or commercial people, subject matter experts, developers, whoever it is, we need workshops to focus a whole team, whole, get whole te the whole team's brains involved in understanding a problem and brainstorming maybe a solution. Um, this, is the way, this is the way to get people focused on the problem they're trying to solve first before they start jumping to solutions. Let me get, it's the way to get everyone's perspective out on the table too. Uh, designers obviously are really strong on visualization. And this is a key thing, like Glenville mentioned in the EasyJet talk, building a prototype, you know, visualizing something, like not just talking about it and putting it in PowerPoint decks, but actually build something tangible that you can play with and interact with and see, well, is this, is this feasible, is this possible? Would anyone do this? What's the best way to execute this? And it often starts with a sketch or, or, or a drawing on a whiteboard, and we iterate those over time. So we surface concepts early and often with the team. We're showing them different ways we could solve this problem. We're getting feedback from people constantly. It's the third part of the process, is to gather feedback constantly from users and the team, from users on, does this solve your problem, from the team on, is this, is this the most feasible way? Is this the easiest way to do, to do this? Is there, a, is there a better way that might be harder, but it's better? So you're constantly making trade-offs as you go through this process of alignment. And doing these things collaboratively and transparently is the most natural way to begin to embed design process. You know, design becomes less of a mystery. You know, it isn't something that some, you know, some guy or girl disappears into a room to do and then there's a big reveal. It's a really collaborative, transparent process. Uh, and everyone realizes they've got a part to play in the design solution. So I know better than anyone else managing teams of designers that designers can be a source of frustration. You know? uh, executives and managers uh, and designers you know, wonder why they're not reaping the rewards that the designers are supposed to bring straight away. You know? They get frustrated when the quality of the vision and the end product doesn't match. And this has a lot to do with how businesses integrate or rather don't consciously integrate design into their existing business functions. Be it, tech, be it development or product management or marketing or whatever, you know. Um, we often, businesses often hire designers and, or design agencies without thinking how they're gonna work with those functions. And they leave designers to figure this out. And this isn't designers' strong suit, you know. This is, a, this is a process, if you want to become a design organization, it's a process of change management. And you need to actually think about consciously, how do I incorporate these specialists into my existing business? Uh, that's literally my full-time job. <laughs> so in Travelport, the designers are embedded on teams. They work really closely with product management, technology, marketing, and so on. Um, design integration starts with how you bring the people who design your products and services into the business uh, and into your processes. So they sit with the teams. They work on the same problems. They have a really collaborative process. There's no mysterious design unicorns huddled away in some corner of the building. It's a really transparent way of working. This means we don't have any kind of misunderstood design divas. We don't have any unicorns because we're just, it's just very normalized in the business. You're part of the team, you work with the team, you're really transparent, and this is a way of just changing the culture to get a culture that's much more willing to incorporate design because it understands design a lot better. Another thing we're working on 
um, or we've been working on in 2019, has been creating a design system for travel port. Um, this is the, uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's a, really a collection of UI components uh, based on a single interpretation of our brand uh, and a single set of principles. So what we're intending to do in, from Q1 onward is to start to roll this out across our product set. And the purpose of a, a design system is to reduce the cost of building products while also improving quality. So they enable us to create consistent and coherent experiences across all our products by sharing the same building blocks, the same DNA. So you can combine your different components, you know, almost ad infinitum, uh, to build your product set. And you end up with a really coherent on-brand set of products across all our, across uh, our entire product suite. So in practical terms, this means when you sign in for one of our, when you sign to a product, you get a coherent, high quality experience. Whether you're a travel agent using one of our next generation point of sale products, whether you are a uh, traveler managing their trip, and the design system is intended to be platform agnostic. This means that it works, it works as well on mobile or desktop. Uh, it works equally well, it looks equally good. Uh, or you're a developer accessing our API experience portal. You know, design systems enable this level of coherence to happen at, a, at scale at an organization the size of travel ports. Otherwise, it's just very disorganized, different people working on different products and they're not, they're not joining up. This is a key, a key uh, artifact. Um, we're in the process of rolling the system out in Travelport, and we're gonna be really excited to launch this Q1 next year, make it publicly available, so people can understand the, the design thinking and the principles and the, uh, that go into building our products and have, have access to it too. The last thing we do uh, is to empower customer-focused teams. Uh, when you're climbing a mountain, you have a vision at the top. You know, you can equip yourself with the, with the tools and the processes needed to climb that mountain. But you're also climbing with a bunch of people, and you want to bring them with you, you know? Because everyone is, is, is part of the solution. One of the things we try and communicate is everyone has a piece, to, a part to play in the user experience. It isn't just designers. UX designers have a terrible job title, user experience. You guys must be responsible for the user experience, right? It's like, no, we're all responsible. To, whether it's an architect, whether it's an engineer, a product manager, someone who writes the content for the, for the interface, we're all responsible for the experience that the, the, um, the consumer gets. Error messages is a classic one. Like, you know, you can, who, in a lot of companies, it's the last thing that happens. People write error codes that aren't meaningful. And this frustrates users a lot because they get an error and they don't know what it means. They don't know what to do. You know, helpful error messaging is really key. So the content person, you know, has a real key part to play in the user experience. So to get to the top, everyone in the organization has to understand that the user's experience is everyone's responsibility. So we're working to equip our teams to get closer to our customers so they understand the industry better, so they understand our customers and their needs better. And because they're, when they're building the solution, uh, they're better able to connect the solution and the problem when they understand both sides of it. You know, if you just tell them, build this feature, don't worry about what it's for. You know, they don't know what good, what good can look like. And they often have a lot of really good ideas about it how it could be done. So the first thing we're doing is, is, is um, uh, like I said, using personas to introduce customers to who our users are, but a persona isn't a real user. It's just a snapshot in time of who your users are. You know, our designers, we carry out research, we invite people on the team to observe the research, to participate in the research. Uh, we, we run through, do the analysis, again, out in the open. We have a room in our office in Dublin where anyone can see the analysis as it's going down uh, to understand and, and start to see trends or, or themes emerging from that research, you know? So we're really open with the research we do. We share that back to the business. Um, we bring that knowledge back to the teams and to the wider company. But one of the most significant steps that we're going to uh, embark on uh, this uh, later this year and into next year will be the creation of a customer panel or a customer community. We've just signed a contract with a company called Vision Critical uh, to, to, to enable us to create a user community where we'll invite mem people from across the world who are travel agents, who are developers, who are uh, ops and admin people to participate in, you know, testing and giving feedback on our products in a really easy, uh, really easy, straightforward way. They could be asked to participate in a quick survey, do a face-to-face -face interview, uh, do some remote testing, take part in a focus group. It's a way to, for us to kind of bring, bring our users into our product development process much more easily, cheaply, and quickly. You get that, that, to get that kind of feedback cycle going a lot, a lot earlier in the process. 
We want our teams to engage with those customers directly and feel that they can, so they can better understand the customer and the problem they're solving. Uh, and we want to get the, that feedback incorporated and baked into the product, you know, ideally at the prototype stage. So when we launch it, it's, a, it's an instant hit. But something happens when you introduce, when you introduce teams and, and people in the organization to the customer. You know, they understand more, they empathize more, they're more motivated, more energized to solve the problem. They actually are really bought in to fixing something for another human being. It's a really amazing thing to see. At the end of the day, our mission is to, to make the experience of buying and, and, tra and consuming travel better for everyone. We want everyone in Travelport to understand that to get to the top, to deliver great products, great experiences, to reap the rewards of the experience economy, we only get there if we work as a team and with a focus on the customer and the experience they have. That's ultimately our objective. Thank you for your time. <laughs>